Welcome to the Higher Education and Climate Justice Workshop. It's Earth Day 2022, and we are so pleased to have you here. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Vancouver Community College is located on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples and acknowledges the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples who have been stewards of this, of this land from time immemorial. So our workshop today is generously supported by the VCC Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Microgrant Fund. In 2021, VCC's International Education Department assumed the leadership role of the University Mobility in Asia and the Pacific, UMAP International Secretariat with the generous support from of funding from Global Affairs Canada. UMAP is a student mobility consortium with over 250 active higher education institutions in 23 countries around Asia and the Pacific Rim. VCC has participated in many UMAP programs, including sending students to a collaborative online international learning COIL program and having faculty members participate in networking events virtually for partnership development. Over the last two years with COVID, UMAP programs have moved entirely online and have become inherently more sustainable and climate just. We have begun to reflect on what our programs and practices mean in the context of EDI, climate justice and higher education. We believe that this is an important and timely conversation to have at VCC with faculty, instructors, staff and students. We believe that climate justice is integral to EDI work. This workshop and our presentation today is the beginning of a commitment to advancing advocacy for and awareness of climate justice in relation to EDI and our everyday work at VCC. Our presenters today are from Aletheia Global Cooperative, a sustainability consulting worker cooperative specializing in transforming international education into a more just and climate conscious sector. First, I'll introduce CJ Tremblay, who is the Founder and Managing Director of Aletheia Global. CJ specializes in strategy, marketing, and, mark and stakeholder relations with 10 years in international education. She received her Global Executive MBA from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. in 2018 and has since completed several training programs in sustainability, social responsibility, and climate action. In July 2020, CJ was trained as a climate reality leader by former Vice President Al Gore. She is proudly one of the founding members and current Vice President of the Board of the Climate Action Network for International Educators, CANI. I'd also like to introduce Sarah Mines. She's a founding member and Director of Sustainable Growth at Aletheia Global. A leader in the international education sector for over 15 years, Sarah has held senior management positions at the Canadian Education Centre Network, the BC Council for International Education, and most recently as the Vice President of Sales at ICEF. Sarah has received a Certificate in Sustainable Business Strategy from Harvard Business School Online and is committed to ongoing learning. Passionate about social change and environmental environmental sustainability, Sarah is using partnership building expertise, her keen sense of strategy and global perspective to create meaningful change in this sector. Without further ado, I pass it on to these wonderful ladies for a great workshop. Thank you so much, CJ. Um, and thank you, Jennifer, for the very kind introduction. And thank you so much to everyone who's joined us here this afternoon on Earth Day 2020. It's very timely for us to be here having this conversation with each of you. We want this session to be a learning opportunity for you and for your teams. We love the work that you're doing at VCC and UMAP, and we're happy to contribute with this presentation. Just a quick note, don't be shy. Please take out your phone and get those QR code readers ready. We've all used, uh, we are all used to using them during the pandemic. Um, and there's going to be a few spots today in the presentation where we want to hear from you. Um, there will be some polls as well as a Q&A section. Please don't hesitate to put your questions in at any time and we'll address those as we go through the presentation.
Before we get started, we'd also like to acknowledge that we're joining virtually from the traditional, ancestral, and stolen territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And this is where my climate journey begins. As some of you may know, I moved to Squamish approximately three years ago. And like most kids born and bred in BC, I have a deep connection to the earth, the forest, and the ocean. The smell of fresh cut cedar, a roaring fire by the river, and in late summer, the pungent smell of the last of the salmon fighting their way upstream to spawn. This is my happy place. I've always known this, but somehow during COVID, it forced me to sit still, to understand that the impact of nature on my mental and physical health came to the forefront. I also realized how privileged I am. My needs were and are still being met. I have a home, I have access to clean water, an abundance of food and drink, and safety and security of person. And as I began to dig into the social injustices of the world, and as they were keeping me up at night, I wanted to do more, to take action, and to hopefully affect change that will allow my cousins, their children, and their grandchildren to live and thrive in a more just world. And this is what brings me here today with Alethea Global Cooperative. I, my name is Sarah Mines, and I'm the founding member and director of Sustainable Growth. But before I tell you more about Alethea, I want to introduce you to someone who has supported me along this climate journey and connecting to our work, my friend and colleague, CJ, whose dedication to this intersection has been incredibly inspiring. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you so much to Sarah and Jennifer for those lovely introductions. Um, not going to go too much into it about me, but I am a person who has had the privilege of working in the sector for a little over a decade um, and wearing many hats from recruitment to uh, English language testing um, to now being a founding member of the Climate Action Network for International Educators, CANI, which you'll hear me refer to a couple times throughout. I also sit on the board and I host their podcast just for fun, uh, because I think that this is an important conversation for us to be having. And I love talking specifically about action um, that we can all take. Um, so Sarah shared her climate journey. And my climate journey is a little bit less connected to the environment than Sarah. I'm very much a city girl uh, and have not, not particularly naturey and adventurous in the outdoors. Um, but my climate journey uh, led me to where I am today by way of just kind of always having been a good listener. Um, and it became clear to me as I listened to young people. I have a sister who's about 14 years younger than I am. Um, and also listening to science. Um, but especially those younger people, I heard the need for adults to stop mortgaging the young people's future on this planet. And so I started facing sort of the uncomfortable reality that I made some choices in my life um, in education as a super privileged white lady that were maybe unjust in the distribution of impact, like flying around the world to get an MBA and doing so again probably multiple times over, uh, for work and taking stock of the systems in which I operated and just how blessed I was to work in this beautiful sector, um, but also being completely able to compartmentalize those actions from the impact. So I've been sort of on an unlearning journey over the last several years to address that privilege and take more action, which found me inserting myself into Canny and founding Aletheia. So the rest of our team is on screen here. Between us, there's a wide range of experiences and perspectives. But what brings us together is this important work. And Adrian, uh, our newest member, is also joining uh, today. Hi, Adrian. <laughs> it's exciting to see you. Um, and so, yeah, so I came to found sort of Aletheia because of the great work that Canny um, had done. And I found like-minded individuals to volunteer with, um, and it was evident as we gain momentum in the sector of international education, that the time for change is now, and that this industry and this sector is ready to take action and to do better. And this is where Aletheia Global Cooperative uh, comes in. As Jennifer mentioned earlier, we are a worker co-op uh, focused on supporting institutions working on sustainability and climate action in the sector. 
And just by nature of our business model as a worker cooperative being more sustainable, we're really starting the conversation by walking that talk on sustainability at our most base foundational level. Now our name Aletheia is derived from the Greek goddess, meaning truth or disclosure. It quite literally translates to the state of not being hidden, the state of being evident. And this is who we are. We believe in shedding light on the truth. And the truth is that the international education industry grows and creates more global citizens and the operations required to do to sustain it also contribute significantly to greenhouse gases. It's time for the international education sector to meet the moment on climate action and climate justice. And because it's a journey and we're not all in the same place at that journey, and before we get too far into the presentation, we'd like to hear from you. So our first question for the day, how far along are you in your climate action journey? We'll just give you everyone a few moments to respond. Yeah. And you'll be able to keep following along. Um, one of the very few silver linings of the pandemic as uh, someone who used to work in marketing, the resurgence and adoption of the QR code. So we'll give everyone um, a minute, it should pop up on your phone, and then it will stay on the screen um, as we work through the presentation. Great, so we're seeing responses come in. Okie doke. Okay, so we can see there's a pretty uh, wide diversity here, but it's really great. Um, I love that there's someone in the room who's like, confidently saying they're leading the charge. I love love that energy. Uh, Want to hear a bunch from uh, you over the course of this, but also like it's so important to acknowledge that just getting started is the most important part. So thank you for sharing where you are. Um, this is very common distribution and we're very excited um, to just kind of get started. So today's session, we're going to uncover some truths as our name promises. Um, it will give you opportunity to sort of pause and reflect um, not on your actions as an individual, but rather actions of an organization and the industry that we all love so much. And it will leave you with some key takeaways on how you can impact, make change towards more sustainable and just futures. So we're going to focus on learning. And this is exactly what we're going to look at today. Some real foundational talk around sustainability, which will help make the deep connections between sustainability and international education, and we're gonna do so centering climate justice. And across all of that, we're aiming to provide information that is relevant no matter where you are in your climate journey and doing so wholly while in the context of the power that we have as a sector. So that's gonna be an important recurring topic. Yes, and to take a look um, at what that power might look like. So now let's set the context of the industry and dig into some numbers. International education is significant to BC's economy. According to a 2019 report by Rosalind Coonan, international students contribute $6.6 .6 billion to our economy. But what does that mean? In comparing this with export products in the province, only energy and solid wood were ranked higher with an economic impact of $11 billion and $9.6 billion, respectively. So those are the dollars and cents, but how does that affect us, the people? The industry alone supported 53,000 jobs, and according to the 2018 Labour Force Survey, international education employs more people than agriculture or fishing, with 27,000 jobs, mining, oil and gas extraction with just over 25,000 jobs or forestry and logging at 17,800 jobs. So here we see that the power of international education is strong. In summary, there is over 187,000 study permits that are issued to international students again, contributing to $6.6 .6 billion annually, supporting 53,000 jobs, and six out of 10 of those international students 
and tend to stay and immigrate, which has further impact uh, to our industry economically and across the job sector. International students are seen as vital to the country's post-pandemic recovery model because the skills and education they acquire and their tendency to seek out permanent residency status or work upon immigration. We want you to keep this power in mind as we move through the learning session. So there you have it, pretty much plain as day, uh, the power of the international education sector in BC. Um, and personally, as a fan of like superhero movies, I am not about to miss out on an opportunity to apply a very iconic line of dialogue from Spider-Man to the work that we do every day. Um, so with great power that is sort of demonstrated earlier comes that great responsibility. So at Aletheia, we specifically work with institution practitioners, educators. We don't really work with students, but we do center their voices um, because we talk a lot about the fact that it's, you know, there are students, but it's really their future. And students are begging for us to take the lead and they're taking to the streets. And I believe that we have a responsibility given the nature of our work um, and the sector to lead and do better. And the really great news is that as you saw, you have the power to do that. We have the power to do that. So what I wanna talk about a little bit more is how. Now, what is sustainability? Now we're seeing sustainability pop up so much more than we ever have before. And it's great. And technically, per the dictionary, which feels like a good place to start, it means the ability or to be able to be maintained at a certain rate or level. But that word sustainability might mean different things in different contexts. And that's what we're going to explore because it's great that we're having these conversations. Um, but for the purposes of this conversation, um, there is an authority on this. There is a source of truth, which we're going to refer to a lot, and that is the United Nations uh, and the UN World Commission on Environment and Development defines sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that feels like a conversation or a piece that we can start working with. So in keeping with our leaders and friends at the United Nations, you may or may not be familiar with this framework. This is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They have translated the world's biggest problems into interconnected areas where sustainable development is needed. So there are 17 goals and they're aspirational, but they're also based on need and they were adopted by all UN member states in 2015. Um, and these goals, what they have done has, it's that they've aligned organizations and governments around the world to give everyone a map and pointing them in the right direction. So I often refer to that as the like periodic table of the goals. Um, that listed each of the goals just as a periodic table and there was a good reason for that, which we will talk about a bit later. Um, but this one I find helps interpret the goals and displays their interconnectedness and helps really provide like context for them. So you can see at the foundation, there's the biosphere goals, right? Life on land, life below water, clean water and sanitation. And where we'll be spending a lot of our time today is climate action. Now there are society goals that range from no poverty through all the way until zero hunger and economic goals like decent work and economic growth all the way to sort of consumption and production. Um, and then the last piece of this contextualized description is goal number 17, partnerships for the goals. And that's threaded throughout because while what we call people action, which is goals that don't happen at a global or government level. So you're looking at individual or organizational um, sector-wide type goals. So people action, those actions can't be done alone. Um, partnerships for the goals are essential to advancing any and all of the goals. And so here we can see that at the foundation, 
I just like to look at it this way, right? Like at the foundation, we've got, we need a healthy biosphere, which allows us to have a healthy society. And as COVID has shown, a healthy society, and also a society that is confident in that health, is needed for a healthy economy. And just conversely, to sort of really hit that point home, in the context of this graphic, you're saying, um, my interpretation and our interpretation is that there is no such thing as a healthy economy without a healthy society. And there is no such thing as a healthy society without a healthy biosphere. So one of the exciting parts of this is that the education sector is a major player. Um, institutions and those who lead them have a tremendous amount of influence. Education institutions are contributing to solutions across all of the goals. You help understand the goals and find solutions with research. You play a role in educating students to tackle these big problems. And at the operational level, right, we're all doing our part from an operational standpoint, recycling, buildings, all of the important parts. Um, and one of the things that's unique about not just the education sector, but the international education sector is, and this is really important and powerful, is this is a super relationship and partnership driven work sector. We are highly educated, internationally connected leaders. But there's also a truth that it, the work that we do can have a negative impact on our environment. And we're seeing a great deal of injustice and distribution of harm. And while I don't think anyone in this room, let's call it, um, would disagree that each of these SDGs are critical, there is one particular SDG that is unique and that we have a very short runway to affect change. So climate action is the only one of the SDGs that has a timeline and it's a very short runway in which we have to affect sort of radical change. So calling back to that graphic, climate action is a biosphere goal. The health of our planet is foundation, like foundational to sustainability work. But I do wanna flag this. The whole reason we have to present, prevent damage to our planet is so that we as humans can continue to exist and thrive on it. Um, I say this a lot, like when we talk about this, um, the planet, it's today is her day and we celebrate her. She's been here for, uh, you know, thousands, billions of years and she will be here for billions more. Um, but humanity, uh, we're going to have to get our act together and we don't have a whole heck of a lot of time to do so. So even though we're having this conversation on Earth Day um, and this conversation might feel like it's about the environment, it's still very much about people. Um, and change has to happen all the way throughout at the highest levels, large industry and international education is a player. And so I wanna approach this section again, going back to that power that you have in mind. So what you're seeing on the screen is very simplified science. Obviously, it's the highest level summary. Because this isn't new, and we all know there are many sources of emissions, food waste, energy use, land transportation, air transportation, etc. The science is empowering to understand. And I could talk about it for hours, but I won't. So burning fossil fuels is the leading source of greenhouse gas emissions methane, carbon dioxide, they're leading the cause of atmospheric and ocean warming, which causes climate change. Again, science. Excess energy from those greenhouse gases mostly gets stored in the oceans, which means hotter oceans. It also means hotter surface temperatures, which means more frequent and intense storms and more frequent and intense droughts. It also means more fires. Many of us have experienced this in the Lower Mainland. If we just think back to what happened to us over this past year with massive floodings, atmospheric rains being a common word um, now in our vocabulary, and the Lower Mainland being in lockdown through massive floods and our roads being closed. So it means a lot of things, but it also means this one thing. In August 20 of 21, and then again in March and April of this year, so just a few weeks ago, the IPCC report 
released a series, or sorry, the IPPC released a series of reports on the impact that increased emissions was having on our planet. And as you likely saw in the headlines, we are at a code red for humanity. More emissions means more warning, and that's really bad. That's why it's imperative that as leaders, we rise to the occasion and meet the needs of our students and lead on climate action and climate justice. So here we are, we have a goal in mind, 1.5 degrees. That's great, these are numbers, we can work with that. We are the leaders, we are the ones educating and leading young people, and they're relying on us to make change. Many of you will remember climate strikes. The youth are literally taking to the streets every day and they are begging us for those people in charge to take bold action on their behalf. And we have to act because we don't have the time to wait for our students to ascend to power to make drastic change. The people who are in power now, the people who hold the purse strings, are the ones that need to make this radical change. And that said, while across the world, young people are rising up in defense of their futures, what we learned in the IPCC report that came out in March was that there are millions of people who are being harmed right now by the effects of climate change, and that those in the future who will be harmed are our world's most vulnerable people. So, Thank you, Sarah. Uh, in the spirit of truth and learning and talking about our privilege in a, what is a safe uh, environment, um, it's just important to recognize that our sector, what we refer to often, you know, international education, is a contributor of emissions. Um, looking at our work from K to 12 to post-grad education, the work that we do increases emissions. Now that is not at all to say that the work itself isn't good. That is not what we were talking about. Uh, this conversation is simply about making the connection between our work and our contribution to emissions and the impact and injustice around those emissions. So to better understand the context in which our work is happening and thus hopefully change the mindset around decision-making. And this is important to note because the impact from emissions around the world are not fairly distributed. Additionally, emissions are not equally generated uh, or equitably generated. So that matters to our conversation today because sustainability that doesn't address, uh, there, it's really hard to have a conversation around sustainability that doesn't address injustice and inequality. And the, in the context of the environment, we cannot have conversations around climate action without climate justice at its foundation and vice versa, honestly. So for authentic Jedi work, um, you know, the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work, it's critical to consider how operations might be affecting climate change. So before we go too much further, we just wanted to share a little bit more information that really contextualizes this conversation around moving from environmental racism to climate justice a little bit more. And climate justice is not just one thing, um, but it is framing the dialogue around climate change away from just the pure science and connecting it to social justice. Because in a state of emergency, we don't want to repeat mistakes of the past. Um, we want to ensure that action and change reduce environmental racism. Because any of our solutions are response, we don't want to further disadvantage historically marginalized communities which just might reproduce or exacerbate existing inequities and not make any true improvements. So when we talk about climate justice, we're talking about some of the uncomfortable points in reality that um, if those emissions we talked about are it's really not the people who are generating the emissions that are sort of most harmed by them, climate change is disproportionately harming um, Indigenous, Black and Brown communities and marginalized communities around the world. Um, and there's also a very high correlation between wealth and race and between wealth and emissions. So one of the things that is important to recognize, so like you can see here, there was an Oxfam report 
um, that came out in, I think it was 2018 or 2019, um, that talked about, uh, it was estimated that the richest 1% of humanity emits more than twice the carbon of the poorest 50%. And I just wanna let that sit for a moment because that's a kind of a stunning number where the top 1% um, are emitting more than twice as much carbon as the poorest 50%. And another way to look at that is that the poorest 50% of humanity emits only 7%, while the top 1% emit 14%. So it's just important to acknowledge that correlation between wealth and emissions. And moreover, it's particularly notable in that same report when we look at emissions from transportation. So flying is absolutely one of the most carbon intensive activities most of us will ever undertake. Um, I like to caveat it occasionally, like unless you have a super yacht, uh, your flying is likely the most uh, carbon intensive activity. So while the richest 10% of households globally account for just under about 45% of all land transportation emissions, the richest 10% account for an even higher percentage of consumption of emissions from flying, which is around 75%. And obviously, you can sort of start to see how that's highly connected to the work that we do, as our business model is highly reliant on this kind of transportation. And so for some context, it's really important that we ask ourselves, who are the global 10%? Who are they really? Um, so we're just going to take a quick breather after having shared a lot of information with you here and ask you a quick question. So pulling your phones back out, it should still be on your screen process for a minute what we talked about, and then take a stab at guessing what is the approximate net worth required to be in the richest 10% globally. So we'll leave that there while responses come in. I know I got this one wrong the first time, so it's like no pressure. Great, more responses coming, thank you. All right, so let's have a quick look. Okay, so there's some guesses. Okay, so we're thinking somewhere between 98,000 and half a million. That's great. So 17% of you were correct in that the network net worth required is about less than $120,000 uh, Canadian net worth to be in the global top 10. So that's net worth, all of all of your things. Um, and so, yeah, as senior decision makers, experienced practitioners, uh, majority of those working in this sector in Canada, including myself and Sarah, we all are probably in the top 10% and based on the work that we do. So we're certainly contributing more emissions than our fair share, um, if you will. And I wanna just place us and our students in this discussion, now that there's a bit more clarity in terms of where we sit in this, and also considering the demographics of our students and how many of them may also be included in this. Um, and to be very clear, <laughs> this is not even a little bit uh, intended to make anyone feel guilty. Guilt is deeply unproductive and doesn't make you feel like you can contribute to a solution, and that remains our objective today. But now that we know where we are in this, we can start understanding the connection to our work better. Exactly, and it's important to have that in mind when we do consider sustainability and the global education ecosystem in which we operate. For years, sustainability in the context of our work has been about the very real social and economic benefit of international education. And there's lots of research around that. And many of us are in this sector because we're passionate about creating global citizens through transformational international education experience. Now there's been a lot less research done to the area of environmental costs of those emissions. So we're just going to dig into this a little bit, and this is uh, in perspective, particularly um, when it comes to international student mobility. So according to UNESCO, there are over 5 million international students studying globally. 
And this number is expected to grow significantly to seven or eight million by 2025. Currently, Canada is the third leading destination for study abroad after the US and Australia. And at this point, Canada has recorded that our numbers of international students have remained steady from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic levels. So it's still a major driver for the international education sector and the work that we do. Now the two, top two sending countries, no surprise, are China and India. With the remaining top source countries from Central and South America, EU Europe, East and Southeast Asia, Africa, and to a lesser extent, the Middle East. So many of us in international education are very familiar with this map of global source countries and global destination countries. So with this in mind, we'd like to overlay it and look at another map. Here we look at the distribution of risk that is being affected by climate change. This map is from a study at Notre Dame that assessed countries' vulnerability to climate change and how ready they are in the face of a warming planet. The study considers a number of factors beyond simply how will their weather and coastlines change, but considers factors such as healthcare, food supply, and government stability. So in sharing this with you, we'd like you again to join our chat on your phone and we'd love to hear what some of your key observations may be. If any of you are also interested in contributing to the conversation, you may raise your hand and speak up at this point. So let's take a look at those slides once again as you start to enter some comments. The first one is looking at where are international students coming from and where are they traveling to? So we see North America as a large receiving country in this first slide, and this is where we're focusing our attention today. And now where are those students coming from? And how vulnerable are they to climate change? Awesome, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, just gonna give everybody a few moments, um, but also be on the lookout. So if anyone does want to just flag any key observations, um, feel free, or if you don't wanna type it, because you feel more comfortable talking, like by all means, just feel free to unmute your mic. And Diana, thank you for the comment. Um, I also think it's a very cool map and sometimes it's really beneficial for us to see things in a visual context to see the work that we're doing and how it is affecting the world. Yeah, I know for um, me, when I first uh, saw that, I wasn't expecting uh, quite as, you know, I probably, when I first learned, didn't quite have as much knowledge around the impact um, around Sub-Saharan Africa. I did often think about coastlines and um, stuff. So it was really interesting uh, there. And so one of the things that is a key observation is that when we're looking at um, those maps again, is that even students, who have access to international education aren't going to be feeling the most severe effects. There are certainly some who will, but most of the people who are going to feel the most, who are most vulnerable to climate change are students who are not typically part of the international education opportunity. They're not part of the sphere. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. is sort of the, the most impacted here, and they tend not to be um, markets that we associate often with international mobility. And so these this was one of the sort of key um, observations and also, uh, once again, all of the uh, receiving countries are not particularly at risk, right? So we have the same people who are benefiting from uh, the influx of global knowledge and immigration uh, being less at risk um, than sort of the source countries or um, even people who don't have access to this international education uh, piece. Okay, so we are very shy today and that is okay. Uh, oh, I saw a thing. 
I'll go back. <laughs> right, exactly. So the colonization of learning that students who come generally come from the global south are experiencing as they move here for school. And I think that that is um, a great point. And recognizing that um, effect is colonizing uh, countries certainly not um, at risk. Um, great, thank you for taking the time to write that. Um, and those are exactly right. These are links that are not um, obvious and maybe not links that we think about every day in our work. Uh, but when we layer climate justice as a lens onto the work that we do, it's this is a good reminder to just sort of have in the back of our heads. And so thank you for that comment. Um, thank you for quietly processing. We understand uh, you know, the more people who are just taking their first steps, this is um, totally common. Um, and our objective today was to contextualize those development goals and helping you make the connection between the various ways our work every day is connected to sustainability and climate action, climate action and then climate justice in particular. And so, you know, the education sector as a whole contributes, you know, to the SDGs in a number of ways, um, really contributing solutions and addressing a number of SDGs. And as we mentioned earlier, like international operations um, engage with action on a number of these goals, um, from scholarships to mental health support, to climate awareness, to the partnership development and the way we do our work. We see international, like, and we've seen an increasing number of conversations and critical dialogues, like the ones we're having today. Um, and when we sit down and look at all the ways that our work in the past has engaged with SDG, we kind of see like international operations as affecting the ones you see on screen. So one of the beautiful things about the, you know, sustainable development goals is that you actually can't really separate one from the other. And that's the beauty of this sort of periodic table is they're all connected. They're not more important. Um, each of them serves as an entry point into doing work around sustainability. So you can start to make a difference in any one of these and fold in more and more goals. So you can literally get started anywhere on in terms of actions. And what I think is really wonderful about our sector, and I think it's a big reason why we all do this work in the first place, because we are so committed to the development of global citizens and helping students develop intercultural competencies in service of a better future. Um, and I know, I know that's what's made me super passionate about this sector. I know Sarah and Adrian feel the same and Chelsea, who isn't able to be here with us today from uh, the VCC team at UMAP. Um, these are all things that have brought us together and to do this work. So Sarah mentioned earlier that there wasn't a ton of, you know, research about the impact, the negative impact around international education. There is a tremendous amount of research around the benefits of international education. When we talk about cost benefit, we, there's not really a ton of research around the cost, but groundbreaking research on this has been pub was published in the Journal of Cleaner Production in early 2020 from um, professor Robin Shields, who is a researcher and professor of education out at Bristol University in the UK. Uh, he is a friend of Canny and does a lot of work um, around advocacy and bringing awareness of this work to our sector, just so that we know about it, um, because knowing about it will help us make truer calculations around cost benefit. But this study was around the emissions from international education and developed a model for estimating the tons of CO2 um, emitted from degree-seeking international student mobility. So he used 2019 international student data and looked at the number of international students doing just complete degrees in 2019 and did some modeling assumptions around airline travel, but also accounted for emissions um, during the stay in their host countries. In some cases, it would go up if the student was going from a low emitting uh, country to a high emitting countries per capita. And in some cases, it might have gone down if a student went from a country uh, with higher emissions to a country with lower emissions. And the results of that study showed, as you can see here, 15 to 30 megatons 
So 15 to 30 million tons of CO2 emissions per year. But that was kind of a hard number to process. So like, what the heck does that even mean? Um, but being the sweet angel that he is and knowing what, <laughs> what we need, he was able to sort of say that it is equivalent to the total annual emissions of a small to medium-sized country like Croatia or Jamaica. And, and actually another interesting truth um, about Robin's articles uh, article was that emissions per student are going, so it wasn't like all doom and gloom, it's like being truthful, um, is that emissions per student are actually going down, um, even though more students are studying abroad. So we're starting to see a little bit more about the full picture around international education. Now, there are a lot of things that this study learned, you know, we, we learned a lot from this study, but it didn't give us the information about everything. So what Robin's study said, this is what we know, that degree seeking four year mobility students are emitting this much, but it didn't account for what we don't know. So one of the things we don't know um, is there's a lot that we kind of have to unpack. And he, Robin Shields was one of the first, you know, he'll be the first person to tell you that, that there is a need for critical dialogue around many other dimensions of international. So we don't truly know like the complete carbon footprint of our sector. We don't know how much carbon is emitted in terms of institutional partnership development, uh, the work that goes into agent partnership development, um, everything that goes around student recruitment work, right? The travel, the promotional materials. There wasn't any information. It didn't account for inbound international student experience, study abroad or short-term exchanges. Um, it didn't talk about conferences or professional practitioner travel from like a professional development standpoint, which is why those conferences are so valuable. Um, and then it didn't talk about the K-12 sector at all, which we know in Canada is um, significant. And then it didn't even look into language school student travel a lot at all. So there's a lot that wasn't accounting for, um, and that's okay. The purpose of the study was not to be an accurate accounting of all CO2 emissions. Um, it was really just to show the dependency of higher education on un unsustainable economic um, and social systems and that's why this presentation is framing sustainability and climate action in the context of climate justice. So this is really just like, we're just starting to begin to understand. And it brings up some like practical questions, right? Where are the opportunities to do things differently? What are some really easy peasy reductions, like easy low hanging fruit wins? When can we start implementing some of these changes? Who do we need to talk to to get this done? Those are some really practical questions, right? And then there's also some like more existential questions <laughs> that we have to ask ourselves and face, which is like, how does this change our business model? Um, what is the just distribution of emissions in the futures? Like, we're, we're the adults in the room. Do we need to travel less so students can travel more? And then who are we as professionals if we don't travel? Or don't travel nearly as much as we used to. I know a lot of us identified as being road warriors. Um, and then where, where in the world are the resources to drive this transformation, right? Like this, where does this come from? So there's a lot of really big questions to ask us, but there's also really good reason to start asking ourselves these questions. That's right. And just because we don't know everything doesn't mean that we shouldn't start trying to be better now. So as pointed out, pre-COVID, much of the work in international education has not been just or equitable. We've been leaving people behind and we've been causing significant harm. And herein lies the opportunity. And we want to challenge our industry to not simply slip back to a pre-COVID state of normalcy, but instead to learn from this opportunity and understand how we can all be and do better in the work that we're doing every day. We've shared a lot of information with you so far and we're very cognizant of that. And I'm certain that you, like me, sometimes feel like you're on the tip of that iceberg. But this is not to overwhelm you. It is to help educate you and to bring everybody to a level, level playing field 
And as we know, knowledge is power. So while we might not be uh, knowing everything, it doesn't mean that we can't start trying to do better. And what does that mean when we look at this in context of the students that we're serving? We need to do better, not just because it's the right thing for our students' future, but also because it's the right thing to do for business. Because students are increasingly considering sustainability and climate action when making choices about what institutions to study at. And we have some results here from the Times Higher Education Consultancy Report that came out in May of 2021 that backs this up. 46% of students are assessing whether a university is environmentally friendly. And in addition to that, the report ranked that students rank in the significance of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and climate action was ranked number two only after quality education. And that makes sense given the stage of life when they're selecting an institution and where to study. So one of the more stunning results for those who've been working in the international education sector was not just how many students are looking at sustainability when making the decision to study abroad, but also how many student, for how many students was it the single most important driver of choice. 9% of students in the survey said that a university or post-secondary institution's commitment to and reputation for sustainability is the number one deciding factor. And while 9% might not sound like a lot, it really is. And by comparison, 9% of students are also influenced by a school's graduate employment prospects. So to let that sit for a minute, when we look internationally and specifically at Canada, Many, if not all schools, focus their marketing and recruitment efforts on job placement and immigration. And very few schools are focusing on sustainability. So herein lies an opportunity for schools who are truly engaged in authentic sustainability work. So that was probably one of my favorite um, pieces of data that came out because for, you know, those of us who uh, have been recruiting and in the sector for a decade plus, um, the, you know, the location of the institution and the, you know, employability prospects are things that have traditionally, like as a marketer, like we've leaned heavily on and mm -hmm. in institutions invest in those pieces. And so it's really interesting to see how quickly um, it's come up and just how significant a factor it is in student choices. So Sarah mentioned about, you know, doing this work authentically. So you'll recognize this model. I was not, we were not about to reinvent the wheel here um, in terms of contextualizing uh, authentic sustainability and climate action work in the sector. So much like the SDG, uh, contextualized model where you can't have like a healthy economy without a healthy society and you can't have a healthy society without having um, you know a healthy biosphere we believe that the right mindset allows for more just and climate conscious operations and student experience and advocacy throughout so going back to that authentic work we believe that to do that work authentically it begins with the right mindset which means like measuring our activities today, learning, reducing, and, you know, abating. And that's where we are today, just all getting on the same page. Um, and with that right mindset, we can transform operations where we need to ensure they're just and climate conscious and allow us to embed climate consciousness and climate justice ethos into the student experience through activities, monitoring, increasing student awareness, and increasing virtual exchanges and any other number of activities depending on the institution. And I love that uh, UMAP is doing some COIL work, like that's super um, an important part of that internationalization that is more sustainable and conscious. Um, and then the common thread throughout here, in the same way 
that partnerships is what allows the sustainable development goals and those SDGs to move forward. What is threaded, threaded throughout here is the advocacy work, which connects back to leveraging the power you have as an institution um, and within the institution, both you know internally and externally in the community to advocate for change. Advocacy for climate justice and climate conscious policies. That is an important part, right? So now what? Um, some of what we shared like, can feel like a lot. Um, how can you begin or continue um, now that many of you said earlier that you're just getting started, like how can you continue your path to climate justice? So we did want to leave you with a few key takeaways to empower you to take those steps and really tap into that power you have um, as an institution, as practitioners within a department, uh, cross-functional or otherwise. So it's important to meet your students on the path towards sustainability and being carbon neutral. Your students are begging for this and they will use their buying power, right? We are responsible to make change. It cannot wait for the next generation to solve the problem uh, or it'll be too late. So that is an important piece to take away. The action kind of has to happen now. Um, and another piece is recognizing that sustainability is interconnected. Um, it's really challenging to work on justice, equity, and diversity and inclusion without working on climate action and vice versa, seeing uh, when you keep those maps in mind of those who are participating in international education or education um, are not the ones who are going to be the most vulnerable to that climate change. Um, and we also have to, you know, accept that there are a lot of different places on this journey, but that we are all in it together. So, you know, we can't do it alone. It's really important to um, tap into the sector we have as a power and that responsibility. So reach out to those who have identified an interest in this work, regardless of the department, um, tap into those with the intersection of the interest and that power and start those conversations. Um, you are not alone. There are other people who are keen. I know that I felt alone um, for years until I found Canny, uh, which is where I met Adrian. And then just in like, starting to have those conversations with people in my life. I discovered that Sarah, who has been a good friend of mine for a decade, uh, also had this passion. And so here we are. So having these um, conversations with people um, is an important part of coming together, supporting one another, uh, especially as we move into like a post-COVID reality. There's a lot of different pushing and pulling and um, it's important that there is strength in numbers in having that conversation. and continuing to bring this topic forward. And so I'd appreciate and recognize the efforts that BCC are making to having this conversation today. Um, and then there's no shortage of resources to learn um, and begin to take action. There really is help available. Um, I talk a lot about Canny. I'm a proud board member and there's some exciting stuff um, that has happened recently um, with the website. There's a resource library, but there's tons of um, resources that we'd be super happy to um, share and Alethea and the team here is sort of happy to help and support the learning and I think that BCC um, making this available to you is such a huge and important um, part of that learning and is um, so that's a great place to begin and really all that's required to succeed here is willingness um, and fortitude to choose change. We know that it's not easy. Um, it's easy for things to stay as they are, um, but willingness and fortitude um, are sort of free and they come in strength in numbers. And so with that, um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, and check in to see if there are any questions uh, as we are here to learn. And we had about half an hour um, left to talk about questions or anything. So there's some questions there. So thank you to people who have dropped questions there. There's also, if you wanna drop questions. Um, so what are some small changes that we can start doing from home? That is a very good question. Um, and I think we have 
so certainly some answers for that. Um, and I would say that is certainly a place to start, right? We know that individual action matters. Um, and I just want to recognize, and I will share a bunch of resources um, around that, but an individual action is not as powerful as systemic change. Um, and the responsibility is not on individuals to um, make a change, but there are loads of um, resources to uh, look at. Um, Adrian or Sarah, I'd encourage you to like share. I know one of my personal um, favorites is Adrian, Sarah, and I, and a number of Canny board members um, all went through the climate reality uh, training, which is a free training. Um, and that's a really important way to learn how to talk about the climate crisis. Um, and there's certainly things that can be done. Uh, but one of the most effective things that you can do in, you know, from home is engaging on a sort of policy level with like your local or provincial or federal um, MPs to talk about um, this and advocate for change at that level. And that's an individual action. It also can be an action um, at the higher levels within an institution or a department, um, but that is certainly an effective um, pieces. Uh, and that's what we learn a lot about in climate reality. We learn a lot about science, but also sort of impacts there. And then I would also say project drawdown. Um, and maybe I'll just drop that in the chat. Drawdown. Um, yeah, I have oh, you the climate reality. Yeah, I, Sweet. I got it. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw it Adrian being you. a hero from San Diego. Um, so, so project drawdown and climate reality are links that are very important, but both of those things I would say um, also very much talk about how individual action is important, but it's not like the burden is not on an individual action. It is on sort of that big systemic uh, change. So advocating for that big systemic change is an individual action, but I would say is a like high priority and high impact item, um, as well as everything that we've learned. I talk a lot about like reduce, reuse and recycle and like they're in that order for a reason, but it took me probably until like my early thirties to like learn that um, and sort of apply that ethos to everything um, in our life. Um, Sarah, Adrian, are there any other things that you want to um, ask about here that you're wanting to share? Um, I just just now dropped in the chat. Um, one of my new favorite websites as I was doing um, some research for a recent project. Um, a lot of questions folks in the sector have is, how do we decarbonize? Like this is travel is integral to what we do. Uh, it's central to our activities. How do we keep going on without? Um, how do we decarbonize while continuing our, our operations? And so this um, website that I just shared, Our World in Data, um, it has um, in there, um, let me go ahead and put it in my uh, thing here. Um, if you add um, a different, you can choose where it says add travel mode, um, you can select different modes of travel. Um, so if you are going to go on a recruitment trip or if you absolutely have to visit a partner, um, there are things you can do um, to, you know, combine activities to make the most out of that travel. Um, but also you can take a look at, um, okay, well, if I travel business class, which is a lot more comfortable, um, versus economy class, what is the uh, estimated difference there? And it's, it's pretty significant. So there are little things we can do. Um, just by being more mindful about um, all of the different things that influence the um, emissions associated with our, our, our travel. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I love this next question, which is how can we make our international um, students part of the correct actions? That's a really great question. And we've seen some examples of this. Um, there's obviously like the education piece. Um, is an important part of it. But when we talk about like the urgency of the climate crisis, um, educating students in order to be leaders in a, a future time, that runway is like, they're likely not going to be in charge by the time action needs to happen. So there are some ways to educate um, students now. 
Um, and we've seen examples of that um, off the top of my head. Um, I would say informing students on like, let's say if you're in charge of mobility and you're saying here are the tr various options for your mobility experience or exchange, um, some institutions are posting opportunities alongside the carbon footprint of that choice um, or putting it in the context of the different modes of travel, kind of what Adrian was alluding to, um, if there are multiple actions, right? Like in Canada, it's kind of tricky. Can't really go uh, to a lot of places without flying and even just traveling across Canada can be uh, carbon intensive or like inefficient. Um, so part of that is just letting students make the choice, understanding by being transparent about the um, carbon impact of some of those choices. Um, and there's also, you know, how do, how do we make our international students part of the correct actions? Well, a huge part of that is we are the people who are designing the programs, right? So how are we making sure that programs are designed in such a way that the sort of, you know, we talk about the carbon footprint or like the positive handprint um, of uh, that exchange experience is positive to the environment and where students are going and that it's not just sort of a fun leisure trip um, elsewhere so that it is happening. And so that's like the students making that choice by being transparent about that as well, but also considering um, like how are we designing programs in such a way that we're minimizing the carbon footprint of that impact. Does that, and uh, uh, Adrian or Sarah, like by all means feel free to, or if anyone else has any spe more specific questions, but does anyone else have any thoughts around that they wanted to share? Um, okay, so radical change in the workplace culture. Uh, the struggle, the struggle is real. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second because I think that this is worth, um, if anyone has, um, if anyone else wanted to talk um, sort of openly about this, but that's hard. That is very hard. Um, the workplace culture, especially in international, can be one of um, wanting to travel, but it's having these conversations and like recognizing that like VCC made the space for this, um, you know, made the space for this conversation uh, and that the people in this room now know who else is in this room um, and facilitating those networks um, and bringing up those conversations, right? Like asking the questions in the meetings and, um, and you know, we know there are like power dynamic issues um, and power dynamic within an institution um, and individuals. But I just wanted to recognize that like, yeah, it's, it's not easy, but that the conversation um, and understanding like the allies and being the like example um, of that change is an important part of it. Um, I'm just catching up on the chat here, but if anyone else has anything to say, I would encourage it, that. I'm just gonna, it, yeah, go ahead, Adrian. I'm gonna read the chat. I feel like this this could um, bloom into a really fun conversation. So yeah. um, around the carbon footprint, that term that we hear all the time, right? So it's just part of our mentality. You know, it's your individual um, negative contribution to the climate crisis and all of the injustices and um, everything horrible, right? Around um, what's happening to this planet. And it, um, for me anyway, makes me feel awful. <laughs> And so, and I think that was intentional um, by um, the fossil fuel industry shifting blame onto the consumer. And uh, what we tend to talk about is the carbon handprint. So there's recent um, uh, research around the carbon handprint, which is essentially the opposite of the carbon footprint. So it would be any kind of um, positive um, environmental impacts from, say, for example, uh, student mobility. 
Um, so if, um, if carbon uh, or climate justice was embedded into the curriculum of an international program, for example, um, a student's lifelong activity after they graduate may have um, may be positively impacted by that international experience. And so what I really like about um, that term and what it stands for, um, the carbon handprint, it's really a shift away from doom and gloom and it's more toward positive action. And that's what we need. Um, we really need to kind of break it down and say, okay, what is it I can do now? Which one of these SDGs really speaks to me? Where can I enter? Um, and just really contribute as an individual to this, this um, bigger global problem. And thank you so much, Bob, for bringing that up. Yeah, and I did wanna um, recognize also there, and one of the tools that, so Adrian um, is the lead author of a big canny document that was launched um, on Wednesday. Actually, it's called the Canny Accord. And so in terms of like facilitating conversations and like changing workplace culture, um, the Canny Accord lists um, and serves as a really good framework for the international sector on how, you know, what are actions that we can do. And so sometimes it just seems like it's really difficult to figure out where to start. Um, and what the Canning Accord does is provide like, I think it was 70, a list of 70 actions across five different categories. Um, and Adrian, if, I don't know if you could drop that in the chat, but that is a really helpful document in terms of advancing the conversation and giving you an idea of not just like what you can do better, but like what you can already, what you're likely already doing that is positive and upon which, right, when you've got like a foundation that is something you can build on, um, then it isn't quite as, there's not quite as much resistance because it's something that you can build on because some of the things you're already doing. Um, and so that's an important piece of that. So that document, which is super, super new to the sector, um, just like two days, <laughs> two days old, um, is I think a helpful tool in potentially um, facilitating some of those like workplace culture changes because a lot of some of the things that can be changed operationally within an international um, education office is already happening. Um, and so one last question here that I, no, I'm not going to put back on my screen, but it says, which actions can we, uh, we can create in collaboration between staff and students that can make sort of learn in a fun way? Um, and that's a great question. Um, there are, there's a ton um, of information online around like eco-pedagogy um, and how to um, talk about uh, climate action and sustainability and integrate it into um, the academic learning experience for students. I am very much not a professor. Uh, and do not have any teaching experience. Um, so from a faculty standpoint, um, but there are members um, within Canny. And I think if you are, if that's something you're interested in and it's something that you're not sure about, um, there is a network um, for that, right? Uh, there are other institutions or other practitioners or faculty members who are sharing best practices around eco-pedagogy. Um, there's some presentations um, on online and lots of great resources to do exactly that um, because it can be a heavy, not fun topic. Um, so I, I recognize, um, yeah, I recognize that Adrian or Sarah, or if anyone else sort of in the room has um, experiences or thoughts they want to share. I, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but um, no, please. I I would recommend um, you know leaning on international students. So, for example, if you have um, a group of students from India, for example, um, chances are there's a high majority of vegetarians. And so why not celebrate um, what the Indian diet typically looks like and then emphasize the benefits of um, not eating meat, um, the, the um, agriculture and agribusiness is a huge contributor to global emissions and by reducing um, 
the consumption of beef that really has a personal impact um, in terms of carbon footprint, if you want to continue using that term. Um, so there, I think there's some pretty innovative, creative ways to engage students in fun activities, maybe outside of, of the classroom. But if you're going to do programming for students, um, bringing domestic students and international students together to celebrate cultures um, that approach things differently. Um, so it could be a learning opportunity on um, a few different levels. So that was it for the questions. If anyone else has any questions, like by all means, please drop them in the chat. But I just uh, wanted to say thank you for all that engagement in the chat. It's funny, you are specifically recognizing Bob uh, for a minute, who is saying a lot of the things that, you know, in terms of our language um, is influenced by uh, decades and decades of um, lobbying and positioning from uh, fossil fuel organizations and big, big, big emissions, if you will, um, designed to shift the burden onto individuals. Um, and we, you, earlier in the conversation, like, our, very much our approach is not around um, taking this time to talk about what you as an individual can do to reduce your carbon footprint like like it or not those are well not like whether we definitely don't like it but those are some that's some of the like familiar language so we're sort of meeting people where they are but that this is very much about how can you as an individual within your organization change the system um and that's the work that we um focus, focused on so like we know that individuals have a responsibility and an individual responsibility and action is of course um, important but the the work that we can do in our everyday work to change the systems that we influence is sort of part of the conversation that we're looking to advance mm -hmm. and so if there are not um any more questions we'll stick around but Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much to Jennifer and the team um, at VCC for having us uh, here. Um, this is an important conversation and making the space for it um, is part of that big change. So thank you. Certainly um, our pleasure to, to welcome you again. This uh, was made possible by a um, generous support from the VCC Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Microgrant. So um, certainly you, you tied into those elements and how they really can't be um, separated when we're talking about JEDA and we're talking about climate justice, how intertwined those are. Um, really appreciate uh, the wisdom um, that you guys were able to share with us and, and also kind of recognizing where we're at as an institution and as individuals. Um, we work with students, we work within a very large um, organization within a very large industry of international education. So recognizing our place, but also not forgetting that there are things that we can do. Um, and, and I'd love to see the chat uh, excitement and, and lots of ideas and suggestions. Today is Earth Day, so certainly um, taking on this opportunity to find ways to, to celebrate our Earth and look at uh, what our role is in, in climate justice as it relates to that. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, super active group. So this was good to see. So thank you so much. And with that, I think we will. Any final words, Sarah? Um, no, I think I'd just like to, again, thank everybody for your engagement. There's been some really good chatter. And I think there's also been some excellent comments actually coming from two of the Sarahs as well, um, around recognizing that this is um, work that can be done certainly at home, but at a more uh, institutional level and being able to find um, other like-minded people for these conversations. So uh, potentially having the opportunity to, set, to attend some of the Earth Day activities that are happening today um, and reaching out to individuals kind of within your own immediate social circle. You might not know, um, as CJ said, that there are other advocates um, that are in the room, but as more and more people have these conversations, we will find each other and we're able to work together uh, to learn together and to drive the systemic change that's much required.
So thank you everybody for taking the time to join with us today. Great. Well, I'll close the meeting then on that final note. And I really appreciate again um, the, the words that you were able to share with us of the ideas and uh, be able to uh, plant the seed in some and help grow the seed in others. So really appreciate your, your time today. Thank you.